Alrighty, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, coming to the um, Accessibility Advisory Committee today. Uh, my name is Annie Sherry and I am the Legislative Assistant for this committee. Um, I am going to go ahead and call the meeting to order at 4.05 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. And um, we will start off our meeting by doing a quick, um, just like roll call and audio visual check, uh, just to make sure that everyone can, can see everything and interact in the meeting effectively. So I'll, I'll start off with, with Elizabeth. Um, could we just get a uh, signifier that Elizabeth can see the interpreters? Yes, a uh, small uh, square for the interpreter, but it's good, we're good. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, uh, Samantha Horn. All right, missing Samantha and Leslie Gates. Yes, here. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, and then we have uh, Osha Joshi. Right, there we go. Osha and Nicole McDonald. Here, and just a small note on the uh, package that I was in, and uh, your last name is spelled wrong. Uh, okay, it's MC. Yes. Okay, I will get that corrected for, for the minutes. So thank, thank you. you, and my apologies about that. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Rochelle Minette. Here. Great, thank you, Rochelle. And then we have Jackie Purcell. I'm here. Thank you, Jackie. And we have Andrew Taylor. I believe Andrew was here, but I know Andrew sometimes has difficulty with his uh, connection. So um, I will just be monitoring. Oh, there he is right there. So he's come back in now. Um, so I'll come back to Andrew once he's settled in. We have Councillor Diggle Gammon. Good evening, everyone. Pleased to be here. Thank you, Madam Chair, in the interim and the colleagues and staff. My pleasure. And I'll come back, Andrew. Are you good in the meeting now? And we can we can see you, but I can't quite hear you yet. Andrew, are you good? I'm good here, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Then I'll just do a quick check for staff as well. So uh, Melissa Myers? Yes, I'm here. Wonderful, thank you. And then we have Lynn Llewellyn. Hi, hello everyone. Wonderful, thank you. And then we also have Darren Young. Hi, I have problems. Oh, there the video finally come on. Hi, everybody. How are we doing today? Wonderful. Thank you so much. All right. So um, we will we'll get started with our uh, with our meeting here today. So um, agenda item 1.1 is a new member orientation. Uh, we have two different presentations. The first is going to be led by me, um, and the second is going to be led by uh, the accessibility advisor from the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, uh, Melissa Myers. So um, I am just. I'm going to ask Haruka. Haruka, if you are um, in the meeting here and able, are you able to share the presentation for the staff orientation? Sure. For the diversity and inclusion. Sorry, the uh, our like the uh, clerk's office. Yeah. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, Madam Clerk, could you please promote me to co-host, please? Absolutely. And, you know, I think what I will do um, is I will just, uh, I'll share, I'll share my, my own screen. Uh, I'll share my own screen here just, uh, and then fix that after the fact. Um, Alrighty, and can everybody see the screen full screen there? Okay, wonderful. Yes. Great. 
Wonderful. Okay, so um, we'll start off the, the meeting here with our new member orientation because we have one new member. And so uh, welcome, Rochelle. We're happy to have you here. And uh, we will uh, get started on kind of a bit of a, an overview of how the Accessibility Advisory Committee works. Uh, and just, to, you know, as a, a great orientation for our new member, but also as an opportunity for a refresh for, for our uh, returning members as well. So um, the first slide here is a, an overview of the HRM uh, decision-making process. And I apologize for the, the size of this, uh, of this slide. Um, there's a lot of information to fit all onto uh, to one piece here, but um, this is available online for those who would uh, wish to take a, a different uh, look at this after the fact. Um, but essentially, there is an, an overview of um, the way that kind of the um, HRM uh, is able to make their decisions and how the process works. So we start kind of at the grassroots level of um, engaging with residents, uh, community groups, not-for-profits, and businesses. And uh, these groups all provide comments and suggestions on municipal matters through presentations, public hearings, petitions, correspondence uh, during public participation or by volunteering on an advisory board like many of you are on uh, this uh, advisory committee. So um, then the, that group both informs the way that some of our community councils and our uh, standing committees work, but it also provides uh, the um, it provides the majority of the makeup of the advisory boards and uh, committees and commissions. Um, and then these um, ABCs as they are called, um, provide advice to community councils and or standing committees uh, in specific policy areas outlined in their terms of reference. So in the terms of reference for the Accessibility Advisory Committee, uh, the, uh, all of the uh, recommendations that are made, they go to the Executive Standing Committee before they are then delivered to Halifax Regional Council for their uh, final approval. So the role of advisory boards and committees is to advise regional council, community councils, or standing uh, committees on items relating to the mandate of the board or committee as outlined in the terms of reference. The role is strictly advisory um, with no final decision making or direction provided to staff. So as I had mentioned uh, on the last slide, uh, the um, Accessibility Advisory Committee is able to make recommendations uh, uh, to the uh, Executive Standing Committee. Um, they can, uh, you know, make requests uh, for, for staff reports that would uh, be passed through the Executive Standing Committee before coming back to the uh, Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, but the Accessibility Advisory Committee has the ability, you know, to have uh, different business units uh, kind of present on on topics of interest um, and this specific committee as well also um, is working on a work plan as well as having the opportunity to uh, run an annual town hall on, uh, on accessibility within the HRM. Um, so the, there are two kind of uh, pieces of legislation that inform the, uh, the makeup and the mandate of the Accessibility Advisory Committee. The first is the terms of reference for the specific administrative order uh, that outlines kind of, you know, the uh, objectives, duties, the makeup of the committee and all of that good stuff, um, as well as the executive standing order for committee terms of reference, which is administrative order one. Um, so just to give a kind of a bit of an overview of some of the pieces that are um, embedded within the terms of reference here, um, the committee shall advise counsel through the executive standing committee on matters related to persons with disabilities as follows. A, review and monitor existing and proposed municipal bylaws to promote full participation of persons uh, with disabilities. B, identify and advise on the accessibility of existing and proposed municipal services and facilities. C, advise and make recommendations about strategies designed to achieve the objectives of the committee. Um, 
receive and review information uh, directed to it by Council and its committees, and to make recommendations as requested, and E, advise Council on disability issues that may have an impact on the budget planning process through the budget committee of the whole process. Continuing on uh, with the specific terms of reference, um, the uh, next uh, point here is to uh, advise business units in responding to issues and concerns of persons with disabilities when requested to do so by the CAO. Uh, to host community consultations related to accessibility in the municipality, including an annual town hall meeting and report to executive standing committee on the issues identified through such municipal consult or community consultations. Um, significant uh, municipal matters, plans and programs having an impact on persons with disabilities and the disability community shall be referred to the committee for its consideration and recommendations to regional council through the executive standing committee. So you'll see that there within the terms of reference, there are provides for, you know, different avenues that uh, the accessibility advisory committee is able to, uh, you know, advise um, other bodies on within the HRM and uh, a big piece around community consultations and the mechanisms for doing that within this committee would be the hosting of the annual town hall, um, which I'm sure we're going to have um, great discussions about uh, in the future. Um, so all in terms of the, the way that all uh, boards and committees are governed uh, within the umbrella of the HRM is through a, um, a piece called Administrative Order 1, respecting the procedures of, uh, of the council. And um, this is available on the uh, HRM website. And I, uh, this was also, uh, the link was uh, distributed to members of the committee prior to today's meeting. Uh, so within Administrative Order 1 um, is some specifics around quorum and calling a meeting to order. So um, quorum for a committee is uh, half of, uh, is, sorry, I'll start that again. The quorum for a committee of uh, council is um, having like an even number of members is one half of all the appointed members thereof. Quorum for a committee of council having an even number uh, of members is a majority of the appointed members thereof. And uh, the council may determine quorum through adoption of continuing terms of reference and jurisdiction of a committee uh, of council as established from time to time by resolution or by an administrative order or bylaw change of council. Um, so if there were, you know, if uh, there was a desire to, you know, change the, the general makeup um, of this committee, uh, you know, if they wanted, if you want to expand members, if you wanted to lessen the amount of members, um, the ability to, to do so would be through um, changing the respective administrative order that outlines the terms of reference for this committee. Um, another piece that's uh, an important uh, part to look through here that was also distributed to members is the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, and we'll touch on that a little bit more. Uh, well, another piece that I wanted to highlight um, is the public appointment policy, uh, which was also distributed to members, and I wanted to draw specific attention to um, meeting attendance requirements as well as leaves of absence. Um, so under section 8.4 of the meeting attendance requirements um, includes that a member appointed by committee or community council uh, or committee who fails to uh, attend three consecutive meetings of the committee without having been excused by resolution of the committee shall be deemed to have resigned from the committee. Uh, this is a piece that is tied to the um, municipal, uh, the Halifax Municipal Charter. So this is not something that we have a lot of leeway on, unfortunately. Um, it this like, piece around three consecutive meetings is uh, quite rigorous in terms of how we can um, mitigate the expectations of attendance uh, for the meeting, so or for like the committee at large. So um, if you are unable to attend uh, a meeting, um, we ask that you please uh, let myself know as the legislative assistant. Um, and then we can, you know, make sure that, uh, you know, we're keeping track of, of your uh, if you're uh, like ability to attend uh, meetings 
Um, but there are, you know, we recognize that there are also like different circumstances that, you know, might come up that may not allow folks to be able to, uh, to provide a notice of, um, of absences. So, um, you know, the, another way to, you know, make sure that you are inadvertently kicked off of the committee for having missed three consecutive meetings in a row is to declare a leave of absence from the committee. So this is section 3.9 under the public appointment policy. So that states that board members who wish to request a leave of absence for an, extend, for an extended period of time may submit such a request to the board. The board, through the office of the municipal clerk, will forward the request on to the, relative, to the relevant nominating authority for the action of the nominating authority to, to deem this appropriate. So um, we, we recognize that there are definitely like instances where, uh, you know, missing three meetings in a row uh, or missing three meetings at large, you know, may, may come to fruition. Uh, we want to make sure that everybody is, has the uh, opportunity to actively participate in this committee. And um, if you are unable to, to, uh, to let us know about um, you know, like whether or not you're going to be able to attend. And um, please know that the, the leave of absence policy is also there for, um, as an option for you to be able to use. Um, but ideally, you know, everybody is, is uh, coming to the committee and participating in all of that good stuff. But um, these are two pieces that I just wanted to draw everyone's attention to. So the roles of the chair and vice chair, and they are elected annually by the members of the committee, and the vice chair takes on the responsibilities of the chair in the absence of the chair. So um, we will, you know, we'll have uh, a new chair, and uh, then we'll also go through the process of having an election for a vice chair immediately after. So um, that will be kind of our, after our presentation's over, that will be our, our next uh, item of business. So the role of counselors, um, and there are two on this uh, advisory committee. So we have counselor Kathy Diggle-Gammon, and we also have counselor Paul Russell. And their role is to establish and maintain the link between regional council and this advisory board and committee. So um, the counselors are able to provide clarity when the decisions of an advisory board or committee um, of which they are a member reach a higher decision-making body. So if there was something that um, the committee, uh, the Accessibility Advisory Committee had decided that went through um, Executive Standing Committee and then was before Council, um, either Councillor Diggle Gammon or Councillor Russell will be able to provide some clarity and speak to the motion. Uh, we also on this committee have a staff liaison who is assigned um, and attends uh, all of the meetings of the um, Accessibility Advisory Committee. Um, our staff liaison is the wonderful Melissa Myers, and she is the Accessibility Advisor in the Diversity and Inclusion Office. I have included her email here, um, but folks uh, will have that for future reference as well. And Melissa will attend all of the meetings of the, uh, of the committee and can provide support and advice from a diversity um, and inclusion lens as the committee works to uphold the duties and uh, objectives that are outlined within the committee's terms of reference. Uh, so the legislative assistant, who is me, um, represents the municipal clerk at meetings and um, must be present at all meetings. Um, so it is the role of the legislative assistant to facilitate the legislative and administrative functions of the uh, advisory committee and uh, make sure, you know, that we're kind of following the rules uh, that are outlined in all of these documents listed here. Um, so, uh, and if there is any additional uh, legislative direction that's provided by the municipal clerk, um, I will of course be making sure that I'm bringing that to everyone's attention. Um, so my role as the uh, as the legislative assistant um, is like further to uh, coordinate meetings and create the agenda in consultation with the chair, provide legislative guidance and assist with drafting motions, uh, assist the chair to ensure appropriate medium decorum and safety, and take minutes, documents, board or committee decisions, and ensure openness and transparency in the decision making process. 
So the meeting agendas, um, agendas are, they set up the order of business for a committee meeting and uh, provide notice to committee members, HRM staff, and the public of what will be covered and in what order. Uh, so agendas are you know, provided in a format that is consistent with regional council and adapted for the needs of uh, each of the specific committees. And committee members can add matters to the agenda that are within the mandate of the committee by contacting the legislature assistant. Um, normally what we would do prior, like a week prior to a meeting of the Accessibility Advisory Committee would be that we would hold it an agenda review with relevant staff as well as the chair and vice chair. Um, so, uh, but we can, you know, we can take different kind of items, um, you know, up until kind of, you know, like three days prior to the meeting. But normally we, uh, we try to have everything kind of ready to be set in stone about a week prior to the actual date of the meeting. So just a quick piece around kind of going through motions. Uh, there's going to be a few of them today once we go into the election of the chair and vice chair. Um, so, you know, if you are putting forward a motion uh, to do like X, Y, Z, and then a, another member, um, like the, the motion has been moved and seconded, but a, another member on the committee um, thinks that, you know, it shouldn't do X, Y, Z, but it should be, you know, also include W, they can move to amend that motion. Uh, the um, amendment would then be discussed and voted upon. And uh, if the amendment passes, we go back to the uh, discussion on the motion as amended. And, uh, and then the motion is further discussed, voted upon once uh, again to determine uh, the outcome of that motion. Um, if a motion is put on the floor to do X, Y, Z, and everyone is good with doing X, Y, Z, then everyone votes on the motion as is, and it is either passed or defeated. Uh, so the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, um, it applies to regional council, community uh, councils, and boards and committees. Um, section six of the act requires that any member who has any direct, indirect, or deemed pecuniary uh, interest in any matter before the board or committee formally disclose the conflict in its general nature, withdraw from the meeting table when the meeting or when the matter comes up on the agenda, refrain from taking part uh, in the debate and then voting on that matter. Uh, so undeclared uh, conflicts of interest, whether perceived or direct, can put the decisions of the board or committee at risk and potentially expose the member to liability. So a standard on all of our agendas for this committee will be that, uh, you know, that there's always a space for members to declare a conflict of interest. And if you have a conflict of interest, you note it during that time and then you recuse yourself from the discussion on that particular agenda item. So um, some examples of a conflict of interest would be, you know, that a member owns property on the street being considered by the committee for enhanced central uh, water and sewer service. So they are going to be, you know, a direct beneficiary of, uh, of that work. Um, another example would be a motion to grant municipal funding to a local art gallery and the committee member is a director of that art gallery. Um, so it would be, um, you know, it would be uh, good for them to, to take a step back from making that decision so it doesn't um, potentially, um, you know, has any like why or create any liability measures after the fact. And another example would be um, for a motion to register a property as a heritage property and the committee member's brother owns that property. And um, so, uh, yeah, any any of these kind of examples are, are things where uh, one should recuse themselves um, and declare a conflict of interest. Um, but yeah. Um, so the, the first one here would be a direct conflict. Um, the second one would be an indirect conflict. And the third would be a deemed conflict. So as Smokey the Bear here says, uh, apparently, uh, only you can determine a conflict of interest. Um, this is not necessarily something that the clerk's office or other staff are able to provide you with um, advice on. It is, is a, it is a decision that you need to make 
as a committee member as to whether or not it is a conflict of interest. And, um, you know, on, on that note, you can potentially, you know, err on the side of caution. And if you think that there's anything that's going to be perceived as a conflict of interest, um, it is, uh, you know, potentially advised that you would uh, declare it at that time. Um, so in terms of member conduct, uh, the chair is the spokesperson for the committee and will communicate only the recommendation of the committee. Other committee members may not represent uh, the committee or the municipality in any capacity. Uh, members of the public who are appointed to an advisory committee shall serve and be seen to serve in a conscientious and diligent manner that accommodates access to services by diverse communities and is respectful of difference and diversity. And with that, um, uh, that's the end of this presentation. I know it's not the most exciting stuff, but it's uh, good to have, let's see if we can all be on the, the same page here about how the committee functions. And I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen now and, uh, and then we will uh, have an opportunity to kind of have some, some questions and, and comments. And uh, I'll just kind of go through the, uh, the list of uh, for an order of questions here. Um, and then after we've gone through that process, we'll uh, I'll open the floor up to to Melissa and then she can um, she will then be able to uh, provide the presentation on um, on diversity and inclusion office. So um, I don't believe we have Samantha Horn with us. Not today. Okay, so um, Leslie, any questions or comments on your end about the presentation? No questions at this time. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Leslie. And I believe we're, we still don't have um, OSHA. Okay. Uh, and then Nicole, any questions or comments on your end? No, thank you. Sorry for the background noise. All good. I also have a neighbor doing some construction, so all good. <laughs> um, Rochelle, any uh, questions or comments on your end? Uh, no questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie Purcell. No questions right now. Thank you. Oh, and uh, no questions. Great, thank you, Andrew. Uh, Councillor Dickel Gammon. I actually do have one. Right. <laughs> Sorry. I always have to be different, eh, Jackie? Um, so my, my question is really around the chair and vice chair positions. Are they normally um, held by um, persons from the public as opposed to the councillors? Is that true? Uh, I believe generally in a, in a Actually, you know, I might defer to Haruka on this. Uh, she's been around the clerk's office for a bit longer. So um, Haruka, I'm not sure if you're, uh, if you're comfortable with answering that one there. Oh, can you hear me okay? Sorry, my lighting is not that great, um, but to uh, through you, uh, to the councillors and committee members. Uh, so yes, usually at the advisory board and committee, uh, Otherwise, the committee and board level, usually members of the public, uh, the committee chair, vice chair, uh, there is no rules around uh, no guiding that the councillors cannot be chair or vice chair, but uh, from what I see in the past, it usually the members of the public becomes the chair or vice chair. Great. Thank you, Haruka. Any additional questions, councillor? No, that's great, thanks. Great, thank you. And uh, last but not least, uh, Elizabeth. You mean if I have a question? Yes. Yes, just one question. Okay. So as a member of the advisory board, uh, we were to investigate a particular topic, for example, uh, 311, and we bring it back to the committee, uh, and, you know, there hasn't been improvements as, as far as accessibility goes, uh, or we let certain members of the disability committee, or sorry, the disability community as, 
as like, for example, the deaf community, do we let them know or do we not? I'm just not sure as a committee member what our role is. Um, I'm not sure I, I totally understand the, the question. It, is the, the question around like the, the duty to bring information back to the, to the disability community that's being discussed within the Accessibility Advisory Community? community? Yes, I was just hypothetically So if I were curious on a particular situation or topic that many deaf and hard of hearing people um, may face barriers to, uh, for example, calling 311, um, calling through a relay service. So then you have to dial a different number. You can't just dial 311, uh, which may be a barrier. And so if as a community or a committee member going out and finding what are the experiences of the deaf and hard of hearing com community and bring it back to the advisory board, is that something within our mandate as a committee member? Um, so I think, and, and my, I apologize, my answer is going to be a bit broad again, as I'm still kind of new to uh, to the clerk's office here, but I my my understanding would be that in the mechanism for like, you know, doing consultation would be tied to the um, duties and objectives of the committee, as well as, um, generally, this would be maybe something that would be tied to a work plan. Um, so in terms of like doing consultation, generally the main mechanism for that through this committee is the annual town hall. So, you know, it would be of the, it would be the committee's, um, uh, you know, within the committee's purview to ensure that, you know, um, members of the, of the deaf and hard of hearing community are included within uh, the, the space for the uh, annual town hall. Um, but generally the, the mechanisms for doing consultation would be agreed upon by the group uh, at large and then uh, tied specifically back to um, the duties and objectives of the committee. Um, and, I'm not sure if that answers the, the question and, or if like Haruka, if you would like to, to uh, um, answer that, if that if my answer is too, like, is too ambiguous. Yeah, and maybe I can just discuss this offline as well. Um, like for example, right now in this meeting, there's no captioning. There's no captions um, for deaf and hard of hearing um, com the community. We benefit from having the ASL interpreters, but there are members of the deaf and hard of hearing community that do not sign, who rely on closed captioning, and we're not providing that in our meeting here today, and that's an issue. And again, as a community member, knowing that barrier exists, when do we bring that up in inside this committee. Right. Um, so uh, maybe, yeah, Haruka, I'll, I'll turn this over to you for a sec. Uh, sure. Uh, so thank you for the question. And just to add on to what Annie said uh, as an answer to the previous question, uh, so actually, if you take a look at the terms on deference, uh, section six, B, for example, says that uh, this committee shall advise council through executive standing committee on matters uh, related to persons with disabilities, such as identifying and advising accessibility of existing and proposed municipal services and facilities. And for example, even this uh, committee, how 
the meeting being offered uh, can be part of the municipal services, for example. Um, so if the committee members are interested in uh, taking actions or bring some topic to the discussion, uh, the one thing that committee members can do is bring those com topics to the chair and also include legislative assistant and let them know that I like to bring this topics as a conversation for the next meeting uh, so that those topics can be added on the agenda items for committee's discussion. And then addition to the discussion, if the committee wants to take further actions, maybe in the form of motion or so on, and then that's where the committee members get third uh, in the meeting. So uh, what I would say is if the committee members are interested in bringing topics for discussion, definitely consult the legislative assistant. And also the way the committee can make enough action and so on, it really depends on committee's interest or what they're actually trying to achieve uh, as part of the action. Uh, so it really depends. Uh, so I recommend, so when things come up, uh, legislative assistants are here to help uh, to make that happen or devise the appropriate procedures. Uh, so again, I'm repeating myself, but what I would say is if you're interested in bringing something as a discussion or potential action items, uh, I really recommend uh, you communicate with chair and legislative assistant. Thank you, Haruka. And the reason I didn't bring it up originally, you know, previously and now today it's um, open to the public. So that's why I was bringing it up today that it should be accessible in both formats, both with sign language interpreting and captions. Thank you, and that point is certainly taken. Um, I, I know that there are mechanisms within the uh, within the municipal clerk's office around uh, specific meetings uh, utilizing captioning services. Um, so that is uh, if you know if there's an interest there um, on on getting some more information around uh, around what that looks like or how you know budging is allocated on that front. That is something that. Um, Peruka or myself could bring back uh, to a future meeting for sure. Okay. All right. So um, if there's no further comment, we're, are we good? Okay. All right. So I see one further comment from uh, Councillor Diggle Gammon. Um, actually, Haruka did a, a really good job there, so uh, I might not have a whole bunch, but I was I would think that just generally speaking, um, to the to the question of process when information comes to this committee and in terms of how we respond back, um, the, the chair responds on behalf of the committee. But if there are action items, I would think that they might, um, depending on what the topic is, it might go back to the staff within the office of. Um, the advisory committee on inclusion, diversity and inclusion, and then they might then um, respond back to to the to the specific community that might have a question or a need. Um, so that that kind of I was thinking that that might be the process that that happens for us. Um, and then again, I would also think that our minutes are public, and now that the the meeting is now public, uh, so that there are a few ways in which. Um, members of the public will be able to know what's happening with this committee and be able to stay in pace with it. So hopefully between our staff, the committee, and whomever the committee chair is communicating back to community, um, hopefully will be seamless if we do our jobs really well. <laughs> Great, thank you, Councillor. And um, yeah, I think that um, there are certainly like further further conversations to have around the relationship between this committee and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion in particular. Um, and I, I think maybe it, unless there are any other questions, this kind of 
becomes a great segue into Melissa's presentation uh, as well for the next uh, agenda item around the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, unless I see uh, if there are any other questions or comments here. All right. Okay, so um, thank you everyone. Uh, I will now move on to item one, or sorry, uh, which it's the same item actually. And uh, we'll now uh, turn the floor over to Melissa. Um, so uh, you should be able to share your screen now. And um, wonderful, perfect. So thank you so much, Annie. And it's really nice seeing everyone today. And I just want to welcome our new member to this committee, Rochelle. So as Annie mentioned, I am uh, Melissa Myers. I am the Accessibility Advisor for HRM. So I will be your staff liaison for this uh, committee. Next slide. So first, I would just like to acknowledge that Halifax Regional Municipality is located on Mi'kmaq, which is the traditional ancestral home of the Mi'kmaq people. I also acknowledge that the Treaties of Peace and Friendship signed between the Mi'kmaq groups people in the British Crown. Uh, and I acknowledge my responsibility to these treaties and seek to continue virtually uphold them in all of my dealings with our indigenous people and, and all settlers within this territory. Next slide, please. So I'd like to start by introducing you to our team. We have a big team and it seems to be growing by the day. So I'll just quickly go through um, who is who. So we have Tracy Jones Grand, who is actually, I believe, on this call right now. So she is our manager. Gene Director for D9 NCO. We have Hoida Mandani, which is the Senior Advisor of D9 and Inclusion. So Hoida does a lot around looking at different policies. She does a lot, a lot in terms of training. We have Shilka Page Chu, who she is our Indigenous Community. Um, engagement advisor, so she was she works directly with the indigenous community, and then we have myself. We have Kellan Hemstock, where she is a gender equity advisor for fire services. We have Daniel Yang, which she is a bunch services advisor. We have Mafuna uh, Kunchon, uh, which is our community engagement advisor for planning and development. We have Roberto Montiel, which he works with the local immigration partnership coordinator. Next slide. And I need a second slide because that's how many people we have on our team. So we also have Io Ella Jerry, which is a senior advisor for African Nova Scotian Peers. We have AJ Simmons, which is our community outreach with the African Nova Scotian community. And our newest member is Russell Brooks. Books and he will be working at the Anti Park Racism Project Coordinator. Next slide. And so, what does our office do? 
So we do quite a few things. So first, we provide support and advice to business units and stakeholders on development and implementation of diversity and inclusion, inclusion plans within a journal. We also support business units and others on specifically on specific diversity initiatives. We promote diversity and inclusion internally as well as externally. We also provide diversity and inclusion training to municipal staff. And we do that on a regular basis. We also advise on corporate policy through a diversity and inclusion lens. And then we engage community on diversity and inclusion initiatives of the municipality. Next slide. So what is diversity? And I think everybody has their own terms in terms of what diversity means to them. But this is um, a giant definition. So diversity is a combination of differences and similarities among people. It, it is more than, than race, ability, sex, sexual orientation, language, gender, or any other descriptive category. Diversity means understanding and utilizing different views, ideas, life experiences, skills, and knowledge. Next slide, please. And then the thing with inclusion, this is the HRM definition. So inclusion is a community action meant to eliminate barriers so all of its members can fully participate and contribute. It means being supported and valued within the community and organization. And so when I think of like this committee and the, the little time that I've been involved with in this committee, I really feel that's what we bring to the table when this community speaks and when we have conversation, we always try to come at every situation with illusion in mind, more specifically, clearly around accessibility. Next slide, please. So diversity and inclusion, we do have a framework that was developed, I believe, in 2015. Next slide. So within the framework, these are the five framework goals that we always kind of keep in mind as we go through our daily work. work and it's something that all business units also keep in mind when they think of DNI as well. So the first one is inclusive public service. And two is safe, respectful, and inclusive work environment. And number three, equitable employment. Four, meaningful partnerships. And five, accessible information and communication. Next slide. So this slide, we just want to recognize that today we all are bringing something to the table. And we don't often think about it. And I think that is what's awesome about communities like this. We all have our own experiences. We have our own you know, understanding everything. And that's what is so critical about this committee and how we can move things forward. Next slide. So when we think about diversity and inclusion, how do we embrace DNA? 
sell by promote different perspectives, increase skills and new methods and encouragement. To all to support people's sense of belonging and safety. So we want people to feel safe and belong within the municipality. Create space where people feel respected, engaged, and valued. A reflective of the residents served by the municipality. And that's what this committee also does. See increased productivity and innovation. Um, and they have individuals who are engaged. Um, reduce turnover, reduce conflict, and have a respectful environment for our meetings. Next slide. Collectively, we all have responsibility when we think of diversity and inclusion. So, for instance, support HRM in the delivery of services that amplify HRM's commitment to diversity and inclusion. Recognize diversity is a strategic priority of the HRM Council and as well committees. Promote diversity and inclusion. Champion diversity efforts to the work that you do on this committee. We all need to also lead by example. Create and maintain an inclusive environment that supports everyone. And speak out and speak out against discrimination and harassment and be respectful of each other. Especially, we might all have different opinions when we come together. So just be respectful and mindful of people's opinions. Next slide. And this, I think, is one of my manager's favorite slides. So just to keep in mind, diversity is being invited to the party. Inclusion is being asked to dance. Next slide. And I just want to thank everyone. And if anyone has questions, I'll do my best to answer them. So, Annie, I don't know, since you have the list of attendees, do you want to go around with everybody's name and just see if anyone has questions? Yes, absolutely. I'd be happy to do that. Thank you so much, Melissa. Thank so um, if there are any uh, questions for Melissa, we will start uh, with Leslie. Any no questions. Thank you so much, Melissa. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, Nicole McDonald. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. And Rochelle? Thank you for that presentation. I actually didn't know a lot about like what the diversity and inclusion um, sort of office was up to, um, but no, I have no questions. Great, thank you. Uh, Jackie Purcell. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I have no questions, but I just wanna to say too that I've been around for a little bit and this presentation today certainly pulled a lot of things together, very concise and specific. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Hi, Andrew Taylor. No questions, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Deco Gammon. No questions at all, thank you. My compliments to you, Melissa, nice presentation. Okay. And last but not least, Liz. Good job, I appreciated it. Uh, two years ago, I had a similar presentation, but it certainly has grown and it's a great information. Thank you. Thank you. 
Wonderful. And that is all of our uh, committee members, I believe. So thank you so much for your presentation, uh, Melissa. We're um, very grateful to have you here with us and uh, look forward to interacting with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion moving forward. So um, with that, um, agenda item 1.1 comes to a close and we will move on to the annual election of the chair and vice chair. Um, so I will give just kind of uh, an overview of the what the process is going to look like. Um, uh, and then uh, essentially I will run the election of the chair. And then once the chair has been elected, uh, they will then take over and run through the election of the vice chair and uh, going through the uh, the rest of the meeting here. So uh, just to kind of give a, an overview of what this process looks like, um, if you or uh, like if you would like to nominate yourself for chair, or you would like to nominate someone else for that, um, it must be moved and seconded. And uh, then after that point, we will do a, a call to see if there is any further nominations. Um, we'll do that until uh, folks are satisfied with, um, you know, whether or not folks would like to be put forward as the um, as the potential chair for the committee. Um, I will call three times for further nominations. And uh, once, uh, once that has been satisfied, I will then look for a mover and a seconder to close the, uh, close the nominations for the position of chair. If there is one person whose name has been put forward, then they will um, be acclaimed as chair and that will need to be voted on by the committee. If there are multiple people who um, would like to put their names forward for chair, we will then uh, be sending around a survey monkey for folks to do and we will put up the names of the candidates next to a candidate A, B or C and uh, the outcome of that vote will then determine who the chair is and uh, I I will share the uh, the results of the election if there are multiple candidates, and uh, and then there will be a, a vote on the uh, on the position of chair. So, um, are there any questions or comments about the the process first before I uh, move to open the floor? All right. Okay, so seeing none, I'm going to open the floor for nominations for the position of chair. And I see that Councillor Daigle Gaiman has a nomination to make. Yes, please. I, I believe that our current vice chair, Andrew Taylor has done a really nice job and it's a good succession plan. Um, so with his consent, I would like to nominate Andrew Taylor for the position of chair. Wonderful, and do I have a seconder on that motion? I will second that. Thank you, Jackie. <clears throat> And uh, Andrew Taylor, you have been uh, moved and seconded as the nominee for chair. Do you accept the, uh, accept the nomination? I do. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, now I will see if there are uh, any further nominations for the position of chair. For a second time, are there any further nominations for the position of chair? And for a third time, are there any further nominations for the position of chair? All right, and hearing none. Um, oh, the, is it too late to move? Uh, um, Haruka, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, after the third call, does is it too late to move for a position? For I believe to... that was the third call, but the motion to close your nomination has, has not been made right. yet. So, right. So then, thank you, Haruka. Um, very okay. grateful that so... Haruka is here for all things clerk, as I am very much still learning. So, uh, Elizabeth, yes, there is an opportunity to uh, for um for a nomination to still be made. I was going to move uh, Jackie Purcell as chair. Okay, so there a motion has been made. Is there a seconder for the motion for Jackie as chair? I will second, but based on Jackie's response, I don't know that she's uh, she's up for the the nomination. That's well, and well now that there's a mover and seconder, we get to ask. So Jackie, do you accept the nomination for the position of chair? 
A chair stops you from saying what you want to say. So, no, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So um, I will do one more final call uh, as there's been three calls up to this point, but I will do one more final call uh, for any more nominations for the position of chair. All right, okay, and hearing none, uh, thank you everyone. And I will uh, ask for uh, a mover. Uh, for I move to close nominations for chair. Wonderful, and that's Liz, correct? That is, yes. Wonderful, thank you. And can I have a seconder to close nominations? I'll second. Thank you, Councilor Diego Gammon. And um, Haruka, do we need a, a full vote on, on that piece or is it just mover and seconder required for closing? Uh, yeah, that is the all needed. Wonderful, thank you, great. All right, so nominations have been closed. And uh, with that, um, the Andrew Taylor has been nominated uh, for the position of chair. Um, he is acclaimed uh, to the position. And um, yeah, so we, uh, I believe, I, I just wanna check one more time here, just being a, a little bit uh, you know, sensitive in terms of the, uh, of the procedures here. Um, Haruka, now that we have a, uh, an acclamation for the chair, is there still required a, a vote for the committee at large? No, it's not needed. It's considered that the uh, Andrew is acclaimed as the chair. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that clarification, Haruka, and congratulations to Andrew as the new chair of the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Thank you for your nomination and for uh, expressing your confidence in me. Um, I have followed, I am following the uh, annotated agenda I was sent. So once the chair has been elected, taking over the election process. So I will now open the floor for nominations of vice chair. And this requires a mover and seconder. Yes, um, it does. Your chair, may I nominate Jackie Purcell for vice chair? Yes, you may, I believe. <laughs> and I second it, Liz. <laughs> Okay, we have a mover and a seconder. Jackie, do you accept the nomination as vice chair? Yes, I would accept that as long as you promise me you'll be at every meeting, Andrew. I will do my absolute best to be at that's, every meeting. Yes. That's all we need. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> Are there any more nominations for vice chair? Okay. Are there any more nominations for vice chair? Second call. Okay, third call. Are there any nominations for vice chair? Hearing none. I um, would you. like to move that we close the nominations for vice chair. Okay, do I have a seconder for that motion? Second. Okay, uh, we close. The motion is put and passed, I believe. Any any uh, requirement for that, Haruka? Uh, that is great. We have a second seconder, so it means that the nomination has been closed. Okay. Uh, so I've heard no other uh, nominations, so the Vice chair has been chosen, am I correct? It sure has. <laughs> she <laughs> <It> sure has. <laughs> it, is, it is my house, but I'm also very reluctant to move in without somebody else's uh, suggestion for now. I'm very new at this, so forgive me. All right, all those in favor of the motion signify by stating aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay, unless my connection is slow, I'm hearing no opposed. So 
Congratulations, Jackie. You are the vice chair. Okay, so now we have approval of the minutes from the March 22nd meeting. Uh, they had been circulated, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So um, at this point, we uh, would, the, you would ask for if there are any changes that anyone would wish uh, to make to the minutes and uh, barring that, uh, there would need to be a motion for uh, the approval of the minutes. Okay, so the minutes have been circulated, have they? Yes, they have. All right, great. That's what I thought. All right, so I will call for a change. Any changes that we need to these minutes? And if there, if, if there are none, I'm going to require a mover. So who would like to move? I'll move. <laughs> I'll second it. Great. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, I will say that the motion carries. Have we looked at the order of business for this meeting? And do we have any additions or deletions? I'll move the um, approval of the order of business. Okay. Uh, a second. Okay. All in favor of approving? Aye. Aye. Can the person who seconded identify themselves, please? Yep, that was Rochelle. Thank you. All right, so I heard all, all in favor. Did I hear any opposed? I guess not. So motion carried. Item four. Business arising from the minutes. There was none indicated. Okay. Good. Call for declaration of conflict of interest. Do we have any conflict of interest? Hearing none, okay. I'm having a bit of an issue actually with Zoom right now. Yes. What is the issue? There, there. My, my Zoom just signed me out, so forgive me. There we go. Oh, the wonders of technology. Uh, so consideration of deferred business. We don't have any. Okay, correspondence. Do we have any correspondence for this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. There has been no correspondence received for this meeting. Uh, petitions, I see none. Presentations, I see none. Uh, information items have been none. Staff presentation on accessible pedestrian push buttons. Uh, Tassel, I believe you have some presentation to make. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the Accessibility Advisory Committee. My name is Tasso Kutrilakis, and I'm the Director of Traffic Management, and I'm here today to give you a brief presentation on uh, accessible pedestrian push buttons. So, uh, Sherry, I believe you've given me the ability to share my screen. I sure have. Okay, let me see how this works now. <laughs>
All right, uh, just a second. Is that, do you see my screen right now? Yes, you're all good in your full screen. And I would just ask that you turn that, your, enable your camera again so that Liz okay. can, so everyone can see you, but especially for, for Liz so that she can all see right. who's speaking. It actually, it, it reverts back to, once you do the switch, it reverts back to stop video. So there you go. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. I think, I think we're good. So, uh, so yes. Yeah. So, um, second here, I'm getting uh, some sort of notice here. All right, um, I, I want to give the committee a bit of background uh, as far as why am I here. So staff delivered a pedestrian push button report to the Transportation Standing Committee on February 25th. And I believe the, uh, the clerk has um, circulated the recommendation report that was uh, submitted to uh, TSC. And there were three recommendations in that staff report, all approved by TSC, but one of them was related to accessible pedestrian push buttons. And it's, it is as follows, uh, adjust the programming of the accessible pedestrian signals at all locations to remove the requirement for the push button to be held for three seconds to activate the audible tone and allow for single press activation. So during the my presentation to TSC, uh, members of TSC requested that staff advise the Accessibility Advisory Committee of the direction given um, to switch to a single press activation. So for those of you who don't know, what are accessible pedestrian signals? So, or short APS. So APS assists blind and visually impaired pedestrians to safely cross at signalized intersections. So if a, uh, a blind or visually impaired person wants to cross, they press the button. If they're traveling in a north-south direction, they would get a cuckoo sound. Uh, and if they want to cross to in the east-west direction, they would get this sound called the Canadian melody, and it's it's tough to describe, but I'm I'm sure you've you've all heard of it. Currently, we have 338 APS push buttons deployed at 78 signalized intersections in HRM. And originally, um, these the the way the buttons are set up is to press and hold the APS button for three seconds to activate the audible signal. And the reason that they were set up this way, uh, it was based on national guidelines to make the audible signal available to those pedestrians that need it and reduce the potential for noise pollution. So typically, especially during the summer, uh, those signalized intersections that have APS, we'd get uh, complaints from um, nearby residents, especially in the summer when it's hot out and they have the windows open when they're trying to sleep and they hear the, the, uh, the, the audible signal in the background. So the way that the buttons were set up were, were intended to minimize that, those types of complaints. However, uh, over the last several months, we have met uh, with members of the blind and visually impaired community through the walk and roll group to talk about several um, accessibility issues that they've had, uh, primarily as it relates to APS um, push button maintenance and operation. And with respect to this particular issue, uh, what they said was the three second hold can be problematic for those that use mobility aids or who have physical limitations that make holding the button difficult. And one of the examples used was if you're blind and you have a seeing eye dog in one, uh, holding a seeing eye dog in one hand, and then you have a couple of grocery bags in the other hand, it is very difficult to hold the button in, in for three seconds to get your audible signal to cross the street. So after that feedback, staff made the decision to recommend to TSC 
to reconfigure APS for a single press operation, which means the three second hold would no longer be required and would result in easier operation for those who require the audible signal. So as I said at the beginning, uh, TSC approved the staff recommendation to switch the single press audible activation. Uh, in the report, staff committed to start immediately to reprogram the push buttons. So I challenged my um, electrical staff to uh, you know, set this, you know, make this a priority to have those converted. So approximately six weeks later, as of April 9th, all 338 APS buttons have been switched to single press audible activation. And uh, what we've heard uh, from those uh, advocates, uh, they were very pleased uh, with this change and they were very, you know, especially in the time frame that this work was completed. So finally, I just want to highlight some other APS-related work that has been completed or is currently in, prog in progress since I'm, since I'm here anyway. Um, one of the things that we're working towards is a monthly APS button inspection. So in those discussion with advocates, what we heard was that they're concerned that they come to an intersection and the button's not working. And just to give you some background, our service standard to, uh, to do a preventive maintenance check at all of our signalized intersections is once a year. So we check every component of a traffic signal once a year. Last year, as a result of feedback uh, received, we upped the uh, inspection of our accessible pedestrian signal buttons to twice a year. And quite frankly, that is that is the capacity that we have within our electrical group to do uh, to do that, you know, that frequency of inspection. However, uh, during our TPW uh, business planning and budget presentation to regional council last month, what we committed to was working towards a monthly APS button inspection, recognizing that it's very important for those that need it. So right now, we're, th this is a work in progress. Uh, we're, we're looking at leveraging other HRM staff that work within the right of way on a daily basis, on daily basis to do um, to do this monthly uh, basic inspections for us. So that is a work in progress um, right now. In addition, uh, we completed two training sessions with our APS vendors and manufacturers um, in, in order to make sure that all of our staff that work on these buttons um, are trained to a particular standard. Flowing out of those training sessions, uh, what we completed, and in this slide, actually, uh, it says developing, but uh, as of uh, a couple of days ago, this was completed. Um, so we've completed a documented standard for equipment installation and setup of the accessible pedestrian signal buttons, and also develop a standardized uh, APS maintenance checklist. So when staff go on site to do their detailed inspection, there's a checklist that the staff can follow. Finally, and this is probably uh, the most important uh, issue that I want to highlight, is um, we are currently reviewing all of our signalized intersections and develop a capital work plan to upgrade our remaining intersections with APS. So we still have about 200 uh, signalized intersections without uh, accessible pedestrian signal push buttons. And so just to give you some, some background, uh, for many years, our standard has been that anytime we install a new traffic signal or conduct a significant upgrade to our traffic signals, we install APS. And aside from that program, we have a small annual program 
where we have we reinstall APS at five signalized intersections. And those are types of installations that require minimal other work, meaning that the poles are in the right spot to put uh, to install the APS buttons. And also there's enough wiring within the uh, intersection to accommodate the APS uh, buttons. <laughs> However, on that pace, you know, it'll take us 40 years to upgrade all of our intersections with APS, which obviously is not good enough. However, the challenge is that there is a whole range of improvements that would need to be made at a particular intersection in order to install APS. As I said, on one end, you could have an intersection that's very easy to deploy uh, that to just install APS buttons with minimal or no other work required at a cost of about ten to twelve thousand dollars per intersection. Going on the other end, whereby uh, there's not enough wiring in the uh, underground to accommodate the accessible pedestrian signals. The poles are in the wrong place to put accessible uh, pedestrian signals, which would require a complete intersection upgrade, which can run anywhere between $200,000 and $250,000. So as you can see, it, it's a wide range of challenges that we have as staff. So what we want to do this year is review each intersection that doesn't have APS, uh, set up a priority list, and that would be based on some feedback that we've received either from uh, advocates, individual road users, or organizations that represent the, the blind or visually impaired, such as the CNIB, but at the same time, bring forward a plan to regional council during the next, next budget cycle to see how we're going to tackle this issue. Because, it, you know, the program will be in the millions of dollars, uh, but until such time as we do a wholesome review, we won't have an idea as far as the budget implications on a go forward basis. So this is something uh, that is embedded in our business plan for the upcoming year. So we're committing to uh, bring this forward uh, to council as part of next year's budget discussions. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, as I said, it was very short, but I want to give an update to the committee. I thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity and I open the floor to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Tasha, for your presentation. Um, I have the order of questioning. So, Nicole, do you have any questions? Mr. Chair, um, sorry, if I could just uh, pop in for just one moment. Um, I just, Liz was having some issues and ended up getting booted out of the meeting. And I just want to make sure that she's back and able to, to see the interpreters. Okay. Are you with us? I'll ask, sorry, just one more time here. Um, I can see that Liz is in the meeting here. So just. Um, thank you, Wesley. Yes, I uh, I did I did uh, request. Oh, there she is. Okay. And are are we good? Are we good now? Good. Okay. Yes, <laughs> okay. Sounds thank good. You. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. No tech <laughs> fails are difficulties. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that, Mr. Chair. Um, and yeah, you can uh, absolutely continue. All right, uh, Nicole, do you have any questions on the APS? 
Uh, no, I don't. Thank you. Okay, Rochelle, do you have any questions? Uh, no questions. Thank you. Okay, Jackie, do you have any questions? No, I don't, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Councillor Digo. I do have a, a question, if you don't mind. Um, thank okay. you for the presentation. Um, so I'm going to try to say the last name. Kotrolakis? I'll give you a 9.5 out of 10. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, I'll take it too. <laughs> <laughs> on the 200, um, on this line, like there's another 200 streets. So as a new counselor, I'm learning all this language around the, the service boundary. So are those 200 uh, within a specific um, the transit boundary or are they mostly urban? Does it also include maybe some suburban intersections? I'm just curious about where they might be primarily located. Uh, that's a, a very good question, Councillor, especially since you're uh, uh, fairly new. Uh, yeah, so th these are traffic signals that are currently owned and operated by HRM. So these would be uh, intersections within our, core, within our core service area boundaries. So, for example, in your neck of the woods, yeah. uh, like Fall River Road at the Sobeys there would be included. Like that, that's ours. Okay. okay. So yeah. So being the suburban rural area, a uh, suburban suburban area is occupied by owned and the, the streets owned and maintained by HRM. So this would I include like NSTIR intersections. Right. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That's good to know. Okay. I'll watch for the budget. Won't we all? Liz, do you have any questions? Well, of course, I missed um, the whole thing due to the technical issues, but I'm assuming we are talking for the blind, visually impaired. It's the sound system for the pedestrian crossings. That's what this was about. Yes. And I do have an issue with the pedestrian crossings uh, about if you're going right uh, and sometimes buildings or trees, uh, I'm able to turn right, but I won't because I can't see anything uh, oncoming because of larger buildings or plants that might be in the way or trees. Um, is there anything Ian, I know this is a bit off topic for what you presented, um, but I just really wanted to put that out there for some time uh, at certain intersections where the buildings are bigger. Uh, for example, Gricola and North, I wouldn't feel comfortable to make a right-hand turn because I can't see past the building. So I didn't know if that would be included in a future plan or things to look into. So with respect to visibility at intersections, uh, some are easier than others. So for example, a, a building, you know, the, the, there's really not a whole lot we can do in that particular case. But as it relates to vegetation, if there's particular intersections that you have difficult seeing around, uh, report it to 311. Our staff would investigate. And if there's merit in the, those uh, requests, then what we would do, depending on the nature of the vegetation, would either get municipal crews to trim it, or if it's related to private property, we would send a notice to the private property owner to uh, trim back the vegetation to uh, improve the site distance at an intersection. Um, or would it be then an illegal right-hand turn if the visibility was restricted? Um, 
No, it would not. Uh, it would be, you know, unless it's it did, unless there's a regulatory sign in place that would prevent you from turning right, then then you're allowed to turn right. And Mr. Chair, I, I believe that Liz has finished her, her questions. Yeah, I am. Okay, great. Wonderful. Thank you. Are, are Samantha and Leslie not here? I'm sorry, Mr. Chair, did you say Leslie? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you. So I believe that's everyone accounted for. Okay. Uh, committee member updates. Uh, I see none. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, yes, we've received uh, nothing in advance of today's meeting. Excellent. Uh, added items. I see none. Is that correct? Yes, it is. So the date of our next meeting is May 17th, 2021. So with that in our minds, I will call for a motion to adjourn. Motion I, to adjourn. I so move, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. I, can, I will now state that the meeting has been adjourned. Thank you very much. It is Thank adjourned you. at 1735. So 535. Congratulations, Chair and Vice Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council.